You may be seated. I've been waiting a long time to get back up here to Phoenix. And I'm certainly happy this afternoon to be here. When I'm at Phoenix, uh, there's something about it always makes me feel that I'm uh, sitting among people who are my friends that love me. And, and it's a great uh, prayer warriors come from here to prayed for me for years. I always remember the first meeting that I had here with the um, Brother Outlaw, Brother Garcia, and the ministers here of the city. How the Lord did bless when I was just in the youth of my meetings. Since then, Phoenix has held great uh, something in my heart that's hard to explain. As a little boy, I always wanted to come to Phoenix. I always read about the desert. I had little poems that I made up about it when I was just a little boy about Arizona. I'm so glad to be a, a native now. I guess I'm just about a year old and maybe a little more, but you don't find too many much older than that. Everybody I run into, I say, are you a native? Well, as much as there is, I've been here so long and and I suppose I'd have to go up to the Apache Reservation or somewhere to find a real native. And someone said uh, not long ago, I said, Brother Branham, how do you like Arizona? I said, well, it's been one of my great lifetime anticipations to, to live in Arizona, and God has granted that to me. We're here just in prior of the Businessman's Convention, which has become an annual thing for us. And this afternoon, as we've gathered here for our pre-get-together before the convention, which starts Thursday night, I believe, it's, it's been my privilege for the past, past few years to come and have this little meeting around before the real meeting starts, at, uh, or the convention, rather, starts. Brother Williams is such a very dear friend. He and Sister Williams, I certainly got a warm place in my heart for those people. They constantly invite me back. And so we're happy to fulfill that uh, invitation this afternoon. Also on the platform, Brother Fuller, Brother Jewel Rose, and Brother Tony Stromy from Tucson, and Brother Borders, our campaign manager, and um, the good old precious brother, uh, Oregon Bright. We've been together in many hard battles on the other side of the river. I expect to dwell with him on the other side of the big river someday. I can't think of the brother's name. I was trying. What is your name, brother? Al Boer. Boer, brother Boer. I I know his face. Aren't you the one also interprets sometimes for the interprets for the dead? For the dead. That's and. Um, we're so happy to have all of you here. I was just looking down here in front of me, and I see some of my friends all the way from Arkansas here. When I was here the first time, I told you that everywhere I went, I found somebody from Arkansas. I'm sure if I ever get to heaven to find some there from Arkansas, well, they certainly have been a faithful, loyal people. And now, usually I speak a long time. But I've tried my best to kind of make my scriptures a note so I wouldn't speak too long. And I want to pray for the sick while I'm in Phoenix. Now, the message that I, the Lord has allotted to me, it's uh, sometimes, you know, these things get pretty touchy. And it's been that way in every age. And I've tried my best to stay with it. It's something that if I did not speak that thing that God told me, and if it was wasn't of God, then he, it wouldn't be in the Word. But if it's in the Word and a promise for this hour, then I feel that I'm doing what's right because I'm only trying to keep what He promised for this hour. And many times when you cross up someone in their theology, uh, they fall out with you right quick. But uh, that shouldn't be. I try to I find friends of mine that's of all different denominational churches and so forth. I never fall out with them, brethren. My, I go to their churches everywhere they let me come and speak. But we shouldn't fall out over little ideas. But, you know, 
if I said anything different than what's in my heart, I'd be a hypocrite. And I, I far be it, I might have to meet him someday as a sinner, but I, I certainly don't want to meet him as a hypocrite. But uh, I want to be true. And if I just said, well, I'll just omit this because if the rest of them believes this, that, then what kind of a person? You couldn't have no confidence in me. Now, I couldn't have confidence in God or in myself when I just so easily compromise. Anyone has got to have something that they're sure of. And that's when you can base your faith is when you're sure. But until you're sure, if there's a question, leave it alone until you're sure. Uh, Billy has probably give out some prayer cards, which I think he, uh, he I told him to. And I believe he told me a while ago that he had. Somewhere along there, I'll call a few to the prayer line after a while to be prayed for. And if your card's not called, if it is called, rather, and you're not sure that God is a healer and he's going to heal you, it won't do no good to come up here because it, you won't be healed. You, if there's one question, if you say, well, now, if there's something in my life, I really ought to straighten this up, you go make that right first and then come back to the prayer line. Okay? Because healing is the children's bread. We realize that. It's in the atonement, and the atonement first is applied to our souls. And healing has always forerun every message, and it's also uh, been a means to gather people together. And it's, uh, many people will sponsor a healing meeting, many will come to a healing meeting or to a song festival, but it, when it comes to a poor lost soul to get saved, there's not many people interested in that. They just... But that's the main thing. Divine healing and singing festivals and so forth is just a, as Brother Bosworth used to say, it's the bait on the hook. And you show the fish the bait, not the hook. And that's just the thing to get the people to listen a while so you can really present to them your message. God has did that in every age. Through every age, there's always been a healing campaign. If it's a genuine healing campaign, behind that campaign always is a message. There never is a sign given this for a sign. It's forerunning a message. And I believe the same thing as 17 years ago or 18 years now that the Lord sent me out to start praying for the sick and made a great revival among the people. Many great servants of God has went forth in healing campaigns. And, uh, but the healing campaigns in itself, if you still stay in the same old trend of what you've always was, there's something wrong. That healing campaign wasn't sent from God. It's got to attract attention first. See? Get the attention, and then there's a message. Jesus, when he came forth healing the sick and so forth, he was a great prophet to all of them. But when he began to tell them the truth of the gospel, who he was and what he came for, then he was, he was not popular after that. And that's the way it's always been through every age, and it will continue that way. Now, we're here this afternoon, and then tomorrow afternoon in this same auditorium all at 7 o'clock, is that right, Brother? 7.30. Tomorrow afternoon, or evening, and then Tuesday evening, and I think Wednesday evening also. No, at the Ramada Inn Wednesday. At the Ramada Inn Wednesday. And then Thursday, that's right, starts the, the convention. And the Lord willing, I want to be here through all of it. I'm here, your brother, a helper of God's kingdom, to help you to anything that I can answer your question. I might not be able to do it, but prayerfully, we'd probably understand if we prayed over it and went to God about it and uh, not draw our own opinions. If you're sick, I wish I could heal you, but no man can do that. It's already done. Healing lies in you. It's your faith in the finished works that God did on Calvary with Jesus Christ. And outside of that, there is no healing. Outside of that, there is no salvation. No church, no denomination, no ritual, nothing packs salvation, Jesus Christ. He was wounded for our transgressions. With his stripes, we were healed. He was wounded for our transgression, transgressions. Excuse me. By his stripes, we were, all in past tense, we were healed. Now, upon that, I don't have but just a few moments to speak this afternoon to you, probably 20, 30 minutes, and then we're going to run a prayer line. Each day, as usual, new people comes in, so there'll be new prayer cards given out. 
But we will do all that's in our power, all that God will permit us to do, to pray for every sick person that comes that wants to be prayed for. If there is such a thing as a person flying in, dying, emergency or something, well, you might see Brother Williams, Billy Paul, or some of them, to get them in a room that they don't want to, they can't sit, they're dying, they must be ministered to right now. Uh, you put them in a room so I can get to them right away. But it's much better if you're not in that emergency state that you, that you will just take your creeds and, uh, and your beliefs and just push them aside a few minutes just long enough to listen to what the Scripture says and then what God does about what He promised. And that'll build faith. And you won't even need to be in a prayer line or no one pray for you. You're already healed if you can just believe it. And that's the purpose of it, is to let you, is to bring in conscience to you that what Jesus has done for you. It isn't necessary to come up here and kneel down and pray through until, you, until you're saved. You're saved already, but you have to accept it. Your praying doesn't do it. Your faith is what you're saved by. Not by prayer, but by faith are you saved. Same thing by healing. I'm sure we all understand that. If there be strangers in our gates, we want you to know that as far myself or this group that I'm here with, the Full Gospel Businessmen, we represent no certain denomination, organization. We only represent Christian believers in all denominations. Everybody's welcome. We're just glad to have you. You say, well, I belong to a certain church. Could I be prayed for? You don't even have to belong to a church. You don't have to do nothing but come up here and believe God. That's all you have to do. God does the rest of it. Now, um, I'm wore out one Bible since I started in the healing campaigns or praying for the sick, brother, at Houston, Texas, was giving me a Bible years ago, some 18 years ago, by Brother uh, Kinson and his group. And I wore that Bible back and forth around the world until it just completely wore out. Pages come out of it. I was just given a new Bible. And the strange thing, I'm not superstitious, and I hope you people don't think me to be superstitious. When this Bible was given to me, it had a little, two little markers in it, little ribbons. It's a, a Bible like I had, but there's kids that gave me one. was a, a Schofield Bible. Now, not because that I agree with Mr. Schofield in his notes. Now, probably some of you do, some of you don't. But I just let you know that I just don't take Schofield Bible because I believe that because he's got it so paragraphed off. I'm, that was one of my first Bibles, and I just learned to read it like that. And I just keep the same Bible, which uh, if I had the Thompson chain, it would have been much better. I could have found my text much faster on a Thompson chain reference. But... When I opened the Bible, the first little ribbon in the Bible was a very strange thing. Uh, Where it was was when Solomon dedicated the temple of God. And the glory of God was so great, the Shekinah glory in the building to the priest couldn't even minister. And then the next string was laying where Ezra returned and dedicated the temple. And uh, the third little marker that my wife had gotten me and put in the Bible, not knowing with my name on it and so forth, was laying to Mark 11.22. <laughs> she just stuck it in the Bible, and that's where it was at. That's, if you say to this mountain, be moved. And all of you know when that scripture is in my mind, you take people, that's when those the squirrels come right in, into the, that's exactly. And then the strange thing of it was, my favorite bird, Robin, picture was on the marker. The little bird with the red breast. As the legend goes, and one time he was a brown bird, but there was a man dying one day on a cross, and he felt so sorry for the man till he flew in to try to pull the nails out himself, and he got blood all over his little chest, and since then he's been a red breast. That's why I, I want to meet my Savior, too, with his blood on my, inside my chest, on my heart. And then my first meeting uh, message um, to preach in here is in Phoenix, Arizona. Phoenix is something that can raise up out of nothing. 
That's what God does. He takes nothing and raises up something out of it. And my message this afternoon is titled, for the next 30 or 40 minutes, Paradox. And I want to read from a scripture that a few years ago that I would take a Bible, let you hand me the Bible when I first started the ministry. Just take your Bible. Many of you have seen it do it. Just hold it open like that and say, Lord, where is the message to me? Open to Joshua, the first chapter. Any Bible that you would hand me. Until one night a vision came, which you're familiar, and I seen that Bible come down from heaven, and a hand with a collar or a cuff, I guess, uh, went down the first nine verses of Joshua. That's where I'm reading from this afternoon for my reading, or my scripture reading. My text is found in the 10th verse, and the, um, the, I mean the 10th chapter and the 12th verse. But before we open the Bible, let's bow our heads just a moment. Now, with our heads and our hearts bowed, let's think this. Let's not just, just be an ordinary meeting. We have those all the time. But let's pray, God, each one of us, for this to be an extraordinary. Insomuch that the presence of God will be with us continually through the meeting. Heavenly Father, we are thankful for this grand and noble privilege to be here in Phoenix this afternoon, assembled in this great auditorium here among these people. And now we are just about to approach the Word, and the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And may it be again, Lord, that the Word will become flesh It will pour through thy church and thy people to fulfill the promises of the hour. As we realize that we're we're closing the time, the time is running out, it's blending in with eternity, and we're at the west coast, and as civilization has traveled east to the west, so has the gospel traveled with it, and now... There's no place to go but back east again. It's completed. And we pray, Heavenly Father, that this will be a great hour for all of us, that we might sense the presence of the Holy Spirit, the writer of this Word, back in the building of the tabernacle of flesh, manifesting Himself to us and the pardoning of our sins, the forgiving of our iniquity and with the assurance that he will not impute sin to the believer with the assurance of that and it also that he'd heal our infirmities and take the, the people out of the wheelchairs off of the crutches and give them sight them who are blind and, and extension of days of those who are dying with horrible diseases like cancer and tubercular advanced and Diseases that our physicians cannot curb. It's beyond that. But God, you go beyond all scientific research. You go beyond all reasoning. Grant to your servants this afternoon the speaking and hearing of thy word on the subject of paradox. For we ask that in Jesus' name, amen. Now, in the Bible, Joshua, the first chapter... And Joshua, the tenth chapter, the first chapter, first verse. Now, after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spake unto Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' minister, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, arise and go over this Jordan, thou and all this people, unto the land which I do give to them, even to the children of Israel. Every place that the sole of thy foot shall tread upon, that have I given unto you, as I said unto Moses. From the wilderness and this Lebanon, even unto the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, and to the going down of the sun shall be your coast. There shall not be any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. I will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. 
Be strong and of a good courage. For unto this people shalt thou divide for an inheritance the land which I swear unto their fathers to give them. Only be thou strong and very courageous, that thou mayest observe to do according to all the law which my, which Moses, my servant, commanded thee. Turn not from it to the right hand or to the left, that thou mayest prosper wherever thou goest. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that's written therein. For then thou shalt make thy ways prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. Have not I commanded thee? Be strong and of a good courage. Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed. For the Lord thy God is with thee, wheresoever thou goest. Then spake Joshua unto the Lord in the day when the Lord delivered up the Amorites before the children of Israel. And he said in the sight of Israel, Stand still. Upon sun stand still upon Gibeon, and thou moon in the valley of Agilon. And the sun stood still, and the moon stayed until the people had avenged themselves upon their enemies. Is not this written in the book of Jasher? So the sun stood still in the midst of heaven, and hastened not to go down about a whole day. And there was no day like that before it or after it that the Lord hearkened unto the voice of a man, for the Lord fought for Israel. May the Lord add his blessings to the reading of his words. Now, the subject this afternoon, a paradox. Now, the word paradox, as I have just been looking it up to be sure that, it, that I was right, the word paradox means, according to Webster, that it's something incredible, but it's true. Now, you know, we've heard the old saying that that truth is more, uh, what do they call that, more strange than fiction. Uh, truth is, because when a person tells the truth, sometimes it's very strange. I know a friend of mine that, up in Colorado, they had a survey on, going to have a survey on elk. And there were uh, 21 head of elk in the herd. And my friend, when had been back there hunting, and when the wardens come up and it paid a great price, the conservation had for uh, one of these uh, snowmobiles to go back and have an elk survey. He said, you shouldn't have spent all that money. I can tell you how many elk's back there. And they just laughed at him and said, how many? He said, there's 19. He said, there was 21, I killed two of them. And the warden laughed at him, you're only allowed to kill one, you know. He said, uh, he said yeah, I know you did. Well, I said, that's what I done. There was 21 elk and I killed two. And the warden just laughed and went on back, and that's what there was, 19 elk. See? And he turned around to me and said, you see, Parson, just tell the truth. The people won't believe it. <laughs> see? <laughs> just tell the truth. So... It certainly is more stranger than fiction. Joshua here is a book, actually, it's a book of redemption of the Old Testament. Joshua, we would have to consider to be that the book of redemption. Re because it's a redemption has two parts. Redemption anywhere has two parts. That is, it's out of and into. It takes two parts to make redemption. Out of, into. Moses uh, represented the law which brought uh, them out of Egypt. And uh, whereas Joshua represented grace that took them into the promised land. Another way, was the, the law and grace were two different aspects of God's command. Now, the law brought them out, Moses and Joshua took them in. It also represents something for our day. Now, it represents as they were in the journey coming from, from 
Egypt into a promised land, so have we come out of a world of Egypt, chaos, on our road to a promised land. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it wasn't so, I would have told you. John 14, coming out of, going into. It's law that brings us to recognize we're wrong. But it's grace that forgives us. The law has no hope of, of redemption because, it, and to complete it, it has no grace in it because law only points that you are a sinner, but grace tells you how to get out of it. Law is the policeman that puts you in jail, but uh, redemption is the one who come paid your fine. And uh, out of and into, into grace, the Ephesus. Now we find the same thing, the Old Testament, I think this book of Joshua uh, fits a fitting word for it would be the book of Ephesus of the Old Testament. The book of Ephesians of the Old Testament would be a good thing to title this book of Joshua because it's certainly fitting uh, to this. Now, we find Joshua representing grace or some propitiation that it could not exist in the same time that Law was in existence, neither does any message that forwards the people on ever coincide with a past message. It will not do it. That's where you have trouble today. Amen. Jesus said, does any person take a, a new piece of garment and put it into an old, or put uh, new wine into old bottles? They perish. It bursts them open. They can't stand it. And Joshua could not at all be come into his ministry until after Moses was gone. Amen. So you see the very first verse here, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now arise and take this people to the promised land. Amen. Moses, representing the law, had served its time. It's, the law had served its time. They started out really with grace to begin with. Before they had law, they had grace. While they were in Egypt without law, no one down there, just the priest and so forth, but they didn't have any laws. The law had not yet been given. Grace provided them a prophet. And also grace provided an atonement, the sacrificial lamb. We're getting into that this week on the sacrifice of blood because there lays your healing. So on the atonement, uh, had been provided before there was any law. Grace was before law, during law, and after law. So there was Joshua representing grace was right along with law, but could not be enforced as long as law was in its proper place. And so has the church world. In this last day, it's come along, it's played its part. But there's coming a time where it must cease. It must do it. There's got to be an Ephesians also of this journey, just as it was of other journeys. There has to come an Ephesians, an Ephesus, an Ephesian of this journey. Watch. We're in that law could never save a sinner. As I pointed out, it could not. Therefore, the promised land represented a day of grace. See, he could not take them in, into that journey. And if you notice, in that journey, they had three stages of their journey. First was the preparation by faith down in Egypt under the sacrificial lamb. Then they crossed the Red Sea into the... The wilderness, a separation, which represented another stage of the journey, because under the preparation, when they all got ready, then when they come to the, to the Red Sea, there was a failure again. The people did not believe. After seeing many things that God had did, they still did not believe. And God opened up the Red Sea and took them forth, which we're taught that all the people were baptized unto Moses under the cloud and the sea. 
how they were baptized, repented, and were baptized and come out to walk in a new life in a new land, in a new journey amongst new people, and the hand of God upon them. But it finally come to a place in this walk that they had that they was not satisfied with their walk of grace. They had to come to something that they could do themselves. Now that's where people think today if divine healing or some, any other work of grace of God that there's something that you have to do. You, there's nothing you have to do but believe. Just believe God. And they, if they would have continued on, the promise wasn't given them under the law. The promise was given before the law. Amen. Without any conditions to it, I have given you this land, go on over into it. Amen. But before they got to that promise, they decided there was something they must do themselves. And that we still find that among human beings. We're prone to be that way. But it's something we've got to do. We feel that, that we've got to have something into it also. You do have something into it. That's your surrender of your own will, your own ideas to the will and idea of Almighty God, and it's finished. That's all there is. Just pro take His promise. Don't think of nothing else. Walk by it, and God does the rest of it. Then they want the law. And God always gives you the desire of your heart He promised to. But we find out when they turn one step from the side of what God originally promised them, then that was a thorn in the flesh until the law was taken away, until Jesus Christ came and was crucified to take away the law. It was a thorn in the flesh. And anything that you try to do within yourself It'll always work to your dishonor. It'll work to your disadvantage. Just simply believe God, and that settles it. What God promised, I'm the Lord thy God who heals all thy diseases. See? If there's any among you sick, let him call the elders of the church. He promised the works that he did would be done in his church. Why do we have to accept organizations and so forth that will write that off of the book? See, it's, it becomes a thorn in the flesh, and here at the end time, we meet the thing again face to face. It's up to the Methodist, Baptist, Presbyterians, and what more? See, you, you can't go on. You've got to come back to the entire full gospel. It was made for the full man by a complete God who was made flesh and dwelt among us. And uh, we know that those things are true. Now, if we notice, then their journey in the wilderness is where they got their greatest mistake that Israel ever made until Calvary was when, in the Exodus 19, they accepted law instead of grace. They had grace. They had a prophet. They had, they had a sacrificial lamb. They had uh, redemption. They had been brought to the Red Sea. They had been healed of their diseases. They had had water from a smitten rock. They had... Uh, they had manna out of heaven. Everything they had need of had been supplied. And still they wanted something else. Now that's a perfect type of our Ephesians today. Exactly. We come out under Luther. We went through sanctification under Methodists and came into the restoration under Pentecost exactly like it was the wilderness journey. When God brought us out, we did very well. But what did we do? want to be like the rest of them. Now, we find out that grace is the only thing that takes us through, never law. Joshua here is a type of the last day ministry. See? Now remember, those three stages of the journey, all of it ceased. First, the law and everything had to cease so that Joshua, and Joshua is the same word as Jesus, Jehovah's Savior, that took them from their wilderness into the promised land. Now, I know many hold, and I don't want to disagree with the scholars, but many hold that the promised land represents heaven. It could not represent heaven. It could not because they had wars and troubles and flusterations and everything in the promised land. 
It does not represent the promised land. But you notice just before they entered the promised land, all, all the, the uh, differences that had, had rose up among them, they had, one of the great things was Korah. He didn't want this one-man leadership, Dathan, and how they'd come up before Moses and tried to tell him that the, the message had to mean this and put a different interpretation to it, their own ideas of what it was, and they every one perished. Everyone, Jesus said there wasn't none of them but what perished. They said, Our fathers eat man in the wilderness for the space of 40 years, St. John 6. Jesus said, And they are every one dead. Dead means eternally separated. They're all dead. Yet they enjoyed hearing the message. Yet they enjoyed the manna that fell. Not another manna, the genuine manna. But when it come to the time of when Balaam come out with his false doctrine and said, we're all one, why don't we just go together and let our children marry one another? We are a great nation. We'll make you great with us. Now, anybody with common spiritual understanding can see exactly that same thing even today, marrying all of them together. And it was an unforgivable sin. It was never forgiven Israel. But then Joshua raised up for the exodus. Now we're taught in Revelation, the sixth chapter, of, yeah, sixth chapter, of the seven seals that supposed the book to be sealed up with seven mysteries or seven seals, Revelation 6. And in the last day, Revelation 10, in Revelation 10, we find out that the Lady Osea, last messenger of the last age, in the doing the time of his prophecy, that the seven seals would be opened. The seven mysteries, seven full mysteries that have been left off in every age, have been some of it left off. The reformer didn't have time to take care of it. In the days of Luther, he only preached justification by faith. He was gone. They made a church. After that come Wesley. He preached sanctification. There it was. Along come the Pentecostals. But we're promised, according to Revelation 10 and according to Malachi 4 and St. Luke 22, 17 and so forth, that there is got to come an, an Ephesians to this. There is promised it, friends. There must come an Ephesians that these seven full mysteries of the Word of God must be unfolded. And it's in the Lady of Sin age that this takes place. I believe that we're, we're there. I believe we're right in the shadows of the coming of the Son of God. And as Joshua, just before uh, the Ephesians uh, raised up, so did John the Baptist raise up just before the next Ephesians. And we're promised a, another, another uh, Ephesians is predicted here in the Scripture. Therefore, I think that we are living in the Ephesians again. Back again. To, we are promised that what was left off during those seven ages. Now, you cannot add nothing to the book or take nothing from it. Revelations 22, 18 says so. Who will ever will add one word? or take one word, this part will be taken from the book of life. Now, we cannot add or take. So, therefore, we know that Luther could not get to it, West End and so forth, the Reformers, Knox, Finney, Calvin, on down and so forth, they didn't get it all. But what they had was the gospel truth. But now, in the last days, we are given the understanding by the word that we are going to understand it because there will come an Ephesian age to it. And we're here. Now, Paradox. I'll leave that hang because I just got about ten more minutes. Now we have the prayer line. Paradox. There's some uh, people of the day that do not believe in miracles. They say they just can't believe that there is such a thing as miracles in this modern age. Well, I don't mean to say anything bad about that person, but they are spiritually numb. They, they, they're, they're spiritually blind. 
They have no spiritual sight or spiritual feelings at all. Because no man can sit in a crowd of people wherein the Holy Spirit is fallen, no matter if he is absolutely a sinner or she. But what they're bound to sense the presence of God when you see the word he promised being fulfilled. Amen. Then you'd have to be numb. And when you see it with your own eyes happening, then you'll have to be blind spiritually. I'm not speaking physically, but you can certainly be spiritually blind and have 2020's physical sight. You remember Elijah down at, at uh, Dothan when he went out and smote that whole army blind? The Bible said he did, and led them right into ambush when they didn't know who he was, and yet had his just exactly what he was supposed to look like and so forth, and he went right out to them, but they were blind. And you can stand in the presence of the living God. You can stand under the anointing of the Spirit and see it moving, and still it won't touch you. You can see what God said preached to you perfectly, and then manifest it, and still walk away and don't believe it. Then there's, you're beyond reach. You're already dead, numb, blind, and gone on. They were completely... Uh, the world, I wonder if that same person who doesn't believe in a miracle... I wonder if this thing can only be the things that can, it's real, is those which are scientifically proven. I wonder if you could have any scientist or anybody that doesn't believe in a miracle to explain to me how this world stands in its orbit. How does it keep its perfect time around the equator and away it goes in a just perfect? We haven't got a machinery, a watch, or any kind that can keep time like that. It'll vary a few minutes every month, but that sun is exactly on time. Thousands of years rolls on, she never moves. Certainly. Perfectly. How the moon can, billions of miles off the earth, can still control the tides. Tell me how that in this galaxy that we live in, how could the moon have any effect upon the water on the earth? Scientifically, tell me how it's done. It could not be done because there's no scientific way of telling it. But God set the moon to watch the sea. And when the moon begins to turn its back, when the earth turns away, here comes the tide in. But when he wakes up the next morning and looks back this way, the tide runs back to its place again. It's a watchman. Or you say, that's just on the seashore. No, that's right up here in Arizona. Come back over in the state of Kentucky, wherever you dig a hole down the ground far enough to find salt water, you'll find out when that tide goes out, that salt water goes down in the pipe. And when the tide comes in, it also raises hundreds of miles from the seashore. We could preach a sermon on that. How that God, no matter, he's in glory, but his orders there is just the same effect on the whole world and anybody that takes the promise. His order is given. He has laws of nature. And, and they, they will absolutely carry themselves true from Pentecost or any other time. Any time that God made the promise, he'll still stay with that promise regardless of where the people's at. How many thousands of years old? His laws ever remain the same. How the seed falls into the ground. And it rots. And... Um, to bring forth life again. Looks like if he's ever going to bring forth life, it'd be when it's in his perfect shape. If life was ever in it, then why wouldn't it just come forth, put it in the ground, the life spring forth? Why does all that's around that life, all that's around that germ that no man can find, how is it that everything material around that germ has to die? So it can spring forth again a new life. But everything around it must also die and rot before it can spring forth life. So is it with an individual. As long as there's any human injections, human ideas, then God's germ of life, the Holy Spirit, cannot work. You cannot be healed as long as there's just a, a fraction somewhere that it's not rotten yet. 
It's got all the human elements, all the scientific ideas, all the uh, days of miracles is past, so called. All that has to all, not only die, but rot. Then from there grows the germ of life unto a new life. That's the only way it can grow. That's the reason we don't get what we ask for. We try to take with us so much of our own ideas. That's the reason the Lutheran church could advance so far than, than it did, the Pentecostals and the rest. Because they inject by a bunch of theologians, this ought to be this way, this is for another day, this was for that. There it stays. It cannot grow to that perfect image of Christ until every word of God is received into you and then you become that word. Like the seed that went in the ground. I'd like for him to explain Hebrews 11, 3. The great, the scientist we've ever had, as far as I know, was Einstein. When here not long ago in New York, I was listening to what he had said. And he was talking about the galaxy, how far out it was, and he proved that there was an eternity. How a man going so many million miles an hour would take him uh, so many, or a million light years an hour would take him... Um, uh, so many years to get over there, uh, one, uh, 300,000 or something like that, and 300,000 to come back, and then prove by it somehow that the man had only been gone from the earth 50 years. Eternity. And that's just a little galaxy when God blew him off his hand. The Bible said Einstein finally wound up this. There's only one way that any man can explain the origin of this world. That's found in Hebrews 11.3. We understand that the worlds were framed together by the Word of God. That's exactly right. Science cannot even touch it. And then you say you don't believe in a miracle? How could you do it? How could any scientist ever explain Noah's rain when there never fallen a drop of rain upon the earth until that day? But Noah said there would be a rain. And when Noah's rain come, contrary to all science, there was no Clouds up there that never had been. No rain up there. And they could prove that there was no rain up there. And then when God opened up the heavens and poured out a, a gusher that washed the earth away, that was a paradox. How that it's certainly unreasonable, unexplainable. But we know that God did it because the Bible said so. And we have evidence on the earth today that it was so. God did it. That was a paradox. When God took an old man by the name of Abraham at the age of 75 years old and his wife 65, many years to pass the time of life, a menopause, and when he took that man and gave him a promise at 75 years old to this woman that he was married to, his, his half-sister, and he had lived with her since she was a girl. They had married when she was probably a, a teenage girl. And here she was, 65 years old, and said, You're going to have a baby by this woman. And what if Abraham had said, I, I, I don't believe in paradoxes. I, I just can't accept that. It had never happened. But you see, when you say you believe anything, then you've got to put it in action. That's it. Then Abraham was commanded to separate himself from all unbelief. And... Walk with God alone. And instead of getting weaker, he got stronger. And when he was a hundred years old and Sarah was ninety, the baby come. How could Abraham take his son way back, three days journey, probably ninety miles from any civilization, up on top of a mountain where the Lord had showed him go offer his own son Isaac. Isaac packing the wood up as we know, which is the type of Christ. And up on this mountain he was to offer Isaac as a sacrifice. And when he fulfilled everything that God told him but stabbing his own son to death through his throat when he pulled the knife out of his sheep and raised his hand to obey God to the word. For the Bible said that he knew that God could not make a promise unless he kept it. And he received him as one from the dead that he was able to raise him up from the dead and give him to him again. And when he was ready to obey God to its fullness, he caught his hand and said, Stay your hand, Abraham. And there was a ram hooked in the wilderness around the vines with his horn on top of that mountain where there's lions, wolves, hyenas, jackals, and the great uh, beocious beasts that eat sheep. 
and then he was way up on top of the mountain where there's no water. How'd that ram get there? Abraham had picked up stones all around to build a, an altar. But there was the ram anyhow. It was a paradox. Any man that believes God and takes him at his word, no matter what the situation is, God will perform another paradox to keep his word. For Abraham called the place Jehovah Jireh. The Lord has provided for himself a sacrifice. He still can cause a paradox to happen. He can do that this afternoon if you'll just take him at his word. Daniel, from a den full of hungry lions, how could it be that that man, how could it be that that man on a group of hungry lions stayed in the cave with them all night without any harm? The angel of the Lord, unseen to anyone else, was standing there. It was a paradox. Something had to keep that lion from getting to them. When the Hebrew children went into the fiery furnace, that's against all scientific understandings. In that great age, it was unscientifically for a man to be thrown into a furnace that would, that the man taking him up there perished and they fell into the furnace and lived in that furnace a while. And the only thing it did was loose them from their shackles. That's a paradox. It's unexplainable, unreasonable, but yet it's the truth. Here's Joshua that we're speaking of. How did that man, just an ordinary man, that just come through a, a, a group of creeds that the man had formed and laws and ceremonies with nothing in them. It says anything about giving man power to stop the sun. But here with the commission from God, I'll give you every piece of ground the soldier your foot sets upon. I'll be there. And the enemy was routed. The sun was going down. Them kings had time to get their self together again. The next day he'd surely lose man. But Joshua knew he needed sunlight. And he looked up to the sun and said, Stand still over Gibeon. And moon, stay there over Agilon. And for the space of a whole day, that was all night long, the sun stood still and the moon stood there. That's a paradox. A man walking in the will of God could do such a thing. For he was in a, he was again in an, uh, an Ephesus, in an Ephesians, for, with the gospel. Sure, it was a paradox. Moses with a stick in his hand to go down and deliver the children of Israel was a paradox. When Egypt had all the armies, their well-trained man, it was a paradox. The virgin birth was a paradox. How could a virgin, against all scientific understanding, a woman that know no man, could bring forth a child? And not only a child, but Emmanuel, who proved to be exactly what it said it would be. How could that happen? It was a paradox. Because God spoke to his prophet hundreds of years before, and the prophet obeyed the word of God. And the word was spoken, and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we believe that. Certainly was a paradox. How that he could walk on water. That was a paradox. A human being, according to the size of your feet, couldn't do that. But he did. What was it? Unexplainable. But it was yet a paradox. God did it. We believe it. Feed 5,000 people with two fish and five biscuits. But he did it. Multiplied not only fish, but cooked fish. Not only bread, but cooked bread. How could he turn water to wine? All a paradox. He healed the sick which is with leprosy, which they don't have anything to this day, science don't, to cure leprosy. But Jesus healed it with his word. It was a paradox. And he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. His word still heals the sick. It's a paradox. Certainly. He raised the dead after the mortal life had gone from him. Lazarus, the woman's son at Nain, and Jairus' daughter. He raised the dead with his word because he is the word. And 
Then another great thing in closing, to prove that he was Messiah, to prove what he was, he had to come in order and answer to the word. And the word said, when he spoke through the prophet, the Lord your God shall raise up a prophet like me. There had been many men raised up. And there had been for hundreds and hundreds of years that had no prophet. Oh, they had priests and great men. And as we read the history between the time of Malachi and uh, Matthew, 400 years, there had been great men. But there was no prophet. And then when he come on the scene to prove that he was that Ephesians, made manifest, John announced it. But Jesus was that. He was the Word manifested himself. When Peter came to him one day with Andrew, his name was Simon. And with Jesus standing there, never seen the man in his life. Listen close. When he stood there and looked at the man and said, Your name is Simon, and you are the son of Jonas. That's a paradox. Sure was. Certainly was a paradox. And when Philip standing there heard this and knew that all uh, uh, identity, that this was the Messiah, he was certainly, he believed it. He wasn't numb, neither was he blind. He ran around the bank for a few miles and got his friend called Nathaniel. And when he come walking up, the faith of that man that could bring another into the meeting to see. When he walked up before Jesus, Jesus said, Behold, there's an Israelite. In whom there is no guile. It astonished the man. He said, when did you ever know me? Now watch, this is unreasonable. It's, it's unexplainable. He said, how did you ever know me? He said, before Philip called you, when you were under the tree, I saw you. A paradox! He had need go by Samaria. And when he went by Samaria, a city of Sychar, he was sitting out there waiting for his disciples to go in to buy food. Notice, a woman came out to the well, the ill fame, And he said to her, woman, go get me a drink or bring me a drink. And she said, uh, it's not customary for you to ask that. We're, I'm a Jew or a Samaritan. You're a Jew. We have no, no dealings with you. They said, but if you knew who you were talking to, what's this paradox that to happen? Don't miss it. He said, how... Uh, how uh, can you do say this? I, I'm a woman of Samaria, and you're a Jew. We have no... Deal. He said, but if you knew who you were talking to, or who was talking to you, you'd ask me for a drink. And he went ahead till he found where her trouble was. And he said, go get your husband and come here. And she said, I don't have any husband. He said, that's the truth. You don't have a husband because you've had five. And the one you're now living with is not your husband. Therefore, you said the truth. She said, sir... I perceive that thou art a prophet. They hadn't seen one for hundreds of years. He said, we know that the Messiah is coming, and when he comes, he'll tell us these things. He said, I am he. It was a paradox vindicated. And to be gospel truth. Amen. A gospel that had promised this, and here it happened and vindicated what it was. Now, let me give you a, a great noble paradox here just a minute. And John 14, 12. Jesus said, promised, that the believers that believed on Him would do the same works. Is that right? Yes. God who makes a law or a promise must keep that promise to be God. He does keep it. So think the God... Well, it's a paradox itself. For a God who makes a promise and cannot break that promise to give that promise of the things that He did to His people to follow throughout the age until He returned again. Go ye into all the world. Preach the gospel to every creature. Every creature, all the world. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, and he that believeth not shall be damned, and these signs shall follow them that believe. He's got to keep that word. And because he said it, it went from his mouth, it's got to be fulfilled. All scriptures got to be fulfilled. So it's a paradox alone to hear Jesus, the Son of God, make such a statement as that. The things that I do will you do also. 
Now, the Bible said in Hebrews 13, 8, he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. That's a paradox. Because it has to be done. Heavens and earth will pass away, but not one word that I've ever said will ever fail, he said. It has to be done. Now, friends, I believe that he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. I believe he's just as able this afternoon to cause in this building a paradox because that he promised it would happen. And how much more has he promised? How much more is it leaning in the Bible to this very age that we're living, the Ephesians, again, of the church ages? We've got seven church ages. And we're promised that the lady will see a church age, there will be another Ephesian. That's right. And we're here. I believe with all my heart that Jesus Christ, who made the promise, as I said in my last message, standing away against that wall, I want to share a few weeks ago, Every time you move your finger, that goes around and around the world. Never will stop. Every move you make, you'll see it at the judgment. Television proves that it's here, the fourth dimension. Because the television doesn't manufacture that picture. It only channels that wave into a tube. And you see the picture. Color, everything, every moving object is happening in the world, going right around through here now, making a record. Someday, your record's going to be closed. And you're going to answer to that record. That's right. God, let me so be blended. Let me be so dead to myself and anything around me. Be conscious of the Word of God living among us today. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, Thou art a paradox when God was made flesh. I pray, Heavenly Father, that You will manifest Yourself this afternoon, proving to us here today not only proving to us, there's, I suppose, 90% or more of the people sit here believe that every word. But that we might see you again. And let know that this word that you spoke, that's still traveling around and around the world. Just like a record. Let us move into that record today, Lord. Let us move in and not hear it just like it was coming secondly from a man's mouth. But let that mouth and person and people all sitting here become your word. We're ready to die, Lord, of our own ideas. Just to see you keep your promise, the things that I do shall you do also. I pray that you'll grant this in Jesus' name. Amen. Just before we call the prayer line, I was having a little bite of ice cream one day with an old doctor friend of mine. He said... <coughs> I want to ask you something, Billy. I said, all right. I said, do you believe in... That's where I got this thought, paradox. I said, do you believe in a paradox? I said, sure. He said, I, I know you do. He said, told me about a certain person that had been healed, that had been prayed for, that he'd sold epilepsy drugs to for years. Sometimes they'd have seven or eight seizures a day, strong medicines. And he said, they never did come back for it no more. I see him all the time. I never had it no more. So I want to tell you something, just to let you know I, I believe what you're talking about. He said during the time of the Depression, my son here now is over the store, said he was, he was waiting on a counter, a young fellow just could, said he, oh, they're standing down in line for medicine, and said a, a man come up here and he had his wife, said a little woman, she was, you could look at her and see she was just about to be delivered of any time of a child, and said she just couldn't stand that line no more, said that he brought his wife into the door just leaning on his shoulder and said, uh, my boy went up and said, can I help you? said, yes. He said, here's a prescription from the doctor. But said, I want to make it clear to you. said, I, we haven't got the money yet. said, we'll get it from the county, but my wife just can't stand it no longer. The doctor said she'd have the medicine right away. And said, if you'll just give her the medicine, I'll go right there and stand in the line until I, I get the money from the county. And the boy said, sir, I'm sorry said, it's against our, our rules here to give out the medicine without having the money. You know how the times was in them days. He said, I, I feel sorry for you, but you can't do it. He said, I was sitting back here reading a paper. And I looked up and said, something strangely warmed my heart. So I walked up. I said, wait a minute, son, wait a minute. The man started out the door. I said, well, all right, son. Started out the door and said, I said, just a minute. So what was that? He said, well, this man explained it to him. He said, let me see the prescription. He said, just wait a minute, son. I'll get you the medicine. So I went on back and mixed up the prescription the doctor had prescribed on his paper. And said, so I went up there and had that money. He said, 
handed it to him. I don't know where I'd get it or not, but I just thought I would, so I just felt that I should do it. And said, Billy, when I put that, that medicine in that woman's hand, said, it was the Lord Jesus. Said, I seen a man standing there. And he said, I read later on that the scripture said, insomuch as you have done it the least of these, my little ones, you have done it unto me. He said, Billy, what happened to my eyes? Did I actually see it? I said, yes, sir. I believe it. I believe that you so fulfilled your duty as a druggist and the emergency needing for that. Jesus said, what you have done unto these others, you have done unto me. I believe it. And I believe that same thing today, right here present with this people, that Jesus Christ can manifest himself, make himself the word made flesh among us this afternoon. Will you believe it? The Lord bless you. Now we're going to call for prayer cards for the people to come. And uh, we can't get too many because I think now if I'm looking at the watch right, I've got 25 minutes till we have to close just at 4 o'clock. Okay, but we'll continue on. Now let's start from prayer card. Um, I believe it was A, wasn't it? A. Let's go from A1. Who has a prayer card A1? Let's call you one at a time so if you're crippled, we can pack you. All right. Prayer card A1. Who has it? Raise up your hand. Somewhere in the building. Or way back in the back. Would you come, lady, if you can? One, two. Who has prayer card two? A2. Would you raise up your hand if you can you walk? All right. Come right over here. Get on this side. Three. If you raise your hand right away, I, I can get you. We won't have to wait very long. Prayer card number three. Would you raise up your hand? All right. Uh, man down there. All right. Come over here, sir. Prayer card number four. Would you raise your hand? Quickly now, as quick as you possibly can. Prayer card number four. All right. Number five. Just as I call you, stand up. Number five. All right. Number six. Number seven. Number eight. Number nine. Ten. Ten. Nine, one, two, three. Ten. All right. Eleven. Twelve. Thirteen. Fourteen. Where's you coming, sir? Fourteen. All right. Fourteen. Fifteen. Well, that, that'll, be, that'll be enough right now. That'll be enough for a second because I haven't got too much time. Now look, I want you to give me your undivided attention. Now Jesus made this promise that a little while and the world won't see me no more. Yet ye shall see me. You believe that? Yes. The world, the world is the order of the world. See, that yet he knows they go on off in fashions and things, but they won't see me no more, yet you'll see me. For he promised, I'll be with you even to the end of the world. Is that right? And the Bible said, Hebrews 13, 8, he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. You believe that? Yeah. That's a promise. Now, you don't have to be up here to be healed. Only thing you have to do is believe that word to be the truth. Now, I'm going to ask you, if you will, just to be reverent and quiet for a few moments. Did all of them come in, Billy? Got two out, three out. I would say? Three, three more. Number, number three. Prayer card number three. What, how, what's the Mexican word for that three? Anybody can say it? All right, surely they heard it. What, that, everybody's got that prayer card. Uh, come into the line, will you? Oh, I think it was somebody had it and didn't know it and moved back. All right. Now, now how about, does everybody believe now with all, your, with all your heart? Well, let's pray again. And Lord Jesus, now, we realize that we can read the Word with our best of our knowledge, explain it. But Lord, you're the only one can confirm it. You're the only one can say that it's right or wrong. And Father, I pray today that you'll let the eyes of the people be opened. May we see a paradox this afternoon. Just, Lord, enough to let the people see that you are present, that you are not, not out of existence, and that your word is the same yesterday, today, and forever, for you are that word. For the sake of the sick, Lord, for the sake of those who are suffering. Many probably are here from different parts of the country, or parts of the nation. They must, they're suffering so they couldn't enjoy the, the meetings Otherwise, if they wasn't healed, I pray that you'll heal them. Grant it, Lord. Now, we're only physical human beings and can only preach the word and say what you said to be the truth. 
Now, thou art the one to make it real. I pray that you'll grant it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, I'd just like for your undivided attention just for a moment, and if everyone will just be seated now for a few minutes. Now, as far as I know, of course, I don't know anyone that I can see in the, in the building that I would know out there. Now, you don't have to be here to be healed. Anyone knows that. See? There's a little woman one time, she couldn't get a prayer card, we say, and she touched his garment, and he turned around and looked and said, Who touched me? And they all denied it. And he looked around and seen this little woman, she couldn't hide herself, because, see, the Spirit of God that was in him led him right. He was the Word. And it led right to her, and he told her what her trouble was. She had a blood issue, and she was healed. She believed it, and immediately in her body, she felt that the blood issue had stunched. Is that right? Had stopped right there. Now, he's just the same today. You don't have to be here. Now, the Bible said that in the New Testament now, that Jesus Christ is our high priest. Do we believe that? The only high priest we have. The only intercessor we have between God and man is the man Christ Jesus. you believe that? And the Bible said he is a high priest that can be touched by the feeling of our infirmities. Is that right? How many know that true? Raise your hand. All right. I'm not among strangers on this word. Now, how would he act if you touched him? He'd act the same that he did when he was here because he's the same yesterday day and forever. Is that right? Amen. Now, you just believe. You just say, oh, Lord, I've been in meetings of it, but I'm just going to believe today. I I'm not even going to take no thought of myself. I'm just going to believe with all my heart that you're here. I have a need, and you just you help me, Lord. Now, you do that. Don't get nervous. Just, just calmly faithful. A gift of faith is not something you take and do something with. A gift of faith is you just get yourself out of the way. The gift is getting your own self out of the way. Now, here stands a woman. Father God knows, as far as I ever know, I've never seen a woman in my life. She's a total stranger to me. But, and it, there isn't about two or three people I can see out there to do it. I think this is Mrs. Vale sitting here, Brother Lee's wife, I'm not sure. And then I know these three or four boys sitting right along here. As far as I know, that's all that I see in the meeting at this time that I know. I believe that's Brother Anthony Milano sitting there from New York. Brother Pat Tyler from Kentucky. Outside of that, I know Fred Softman's in there somewhere. I heard him holler, Amen, a while ago. That's, that's about the limit. The Heavenly Father knows that. And this woman's standing here, and i never seen her. I have no idea what she's here for. She's just a woman come up here on the platform, the same as you're sitting out there. Now, if this woman's in need... Well, then, I, I, if I could help her, I, I'd sure do it. But I, 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 I depends on what she needs. If it was money, I, I might rig up 5 or $10. <laughs> Outside of that, I don't know. Let's uh, give her a post-dated check until <laughs> I get my pay next month. But now, what if she's got domestic trouble? Then I'd say, go get your husband. Let's talk together. Maybe I can help you. I have no way of getting home. Well, I'll ask somebody if they'll take you, take you home going your way. If you live down on what street down here or whatever it is, I don't know. But if it's sickness, then I, I don't know. See? But I don't know the woman. But there's someone here. This word that promised the things that I do shall you also. Amen. Now, perhaps, what if this woman is sick? Maybe she's got cancer. Maybe she has TB. And, or something that medicine can't help at this, at this stage. Well, now, I couldn't, I by no means could heal the woman. But now, if he can reveal to me what she wants, just like he did the woman at the well, or like he told Nathaniel, or, or told Simon what his name was, said, your name is Simon, you're the son of Jonas. Henceforth, you'll be called Peter, which means a little stone. Well, now, if he would do something like that here in the presence of all of you, that goes to show that that word is truth. Now, how many will believe that? Is there anybody here who knows the woman? Raise your hand. Any people's in the building? Yeah, man, have you know her. All right. Father knows that I don't. But now, let's just see what he would say. And that would that be a paradox? 
I don't know what's wrong with her. Don't know what she's here for. Nothing about her. But God knows that. I'm going to speak to the woman. This is the first person I've had before me for about three months. Now, I just want to talk to the lady just a moment. And that is what? Contact her spirit. Just like Jesus did the woman at the well. Contact her spirit. Now, if the Lord Jesus, lady, can reveal to me uh, what's wrong with you, or what you're here for, or something about that you know what I don't know nothing about, or something on that order, would you believe it was him? It had to be him, wouldn't it? It had to be him. If he'll do it, then we'll all be thankful that we're nowhere, that his word is right, and we can put confidence in that. Now, if he can reveal what your trouble is to me, and me not knowing you, and you know that, but now, if he can reveal to me what your trouble is, or something about you, then that shows that there's a spirit here somewhere that knows you, and you know that I don't. So it wouldn't be the man, it would be the spirit. And that's what God promised at this time of Ephesus. You believe that to be the truth? May he grant it. I see one thing. She's suffering with something like a sinus trouble up here in her head. That is true, is it? Raise up your hand if it's true. Amen. Amen. But a scientist wouldn't cause you to sneeze and carry on like that, so you have hay fever also. That's right. You're not from Phoenix. You're from where there's, there's lots of hills, trees. You're from Flagstaff. That's right. Hallelujah. You believe God can tell me who you are? Yes, sir. Mrs. Earl. You. Amen. That's right, is it? I go believing, it'll all be over. Praise God. I see the same yesterday and forever. Now the Heavenly Father knows. I'll oh, just see the woman. See, the Word vindicated. Now, it isn't me. I'm just a man. It's like this microphone. It's a mute without me speaking to it or somebody. And so is a man. Just a mute. But it's the Spirit. And that Spirit's right out there among you. See? He's the healer, not me. How do you do, sir? Another man that's a person that's a stranger to me. I don't know the man. Uh, as far as I know, I've never seen him in my life. But now... This Spirit, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit in Jesus Christ is the same self-spirit. The anointed one, Jesus the man, was the Son of God, but the Holy Spirit was on him as God. My Father dwells in me, see? It's the Holy Spirit. So it's still God. Now, if I can just get myself, that man can get his self out of the way, then that part's dead. Then let the Spirit of life go to work. That's why I'll wait just a minute to see what happens till the anointing gets started. If the Lord God, whose presence we're in, will reveal to me, sir, what uh, your trouble is, or something you've done, or, or something about you, just something, of course, more we would talk, more it would go. Let's see if these others stand in the line. But if you just tell me what your trouble is, will... Uh, you believe me to be his servant, believe he's present? A rupture. Is that right? That's right. I say, how was that done? I wish I knowed. There's nobody can explain that. That's a paradox. Amen. Here, that you might know, I've seen something else. An examination. Got heart trouble too. Raise your hand. Mr. Anderson, you can go home now. Jesus Christ will make you a That's right. Just believe. Have faith. How do you do, sir? We are strangers to each other. I don't know you. As far as I know, it's the first time I've ever seen you or me to know you. That's right. But he knows us. Both of us. Now, you know why this is taking place? It's his grace permitting it. They would bring these people conscious of God. Now, not knowing nothing about you, not even knowing you, no, no way, just a strange man to come here. Now, it would be a, absolutely a paradox for something to happen to, to know what's wrong with you or something you've done or something you ought not have done or something you should have done or so, who you are or something about you. It had to be a paradox because there's no way for anybody to know that. 
outside of some revelation of the unseen. That's right. Now, if he'll do that for you, between you and I, so that the audience, not a show, but that they might see the, the Ephesus is here, that this is the thing that bridges between the nomination and the glory land. He promised it. That they might be assured that what we're telling them is the truth. Now, to know you, you know I don't. That's, raise up your hand so people see it. I, I, I've never seen a man in my life. He's just a man standing here. Ask any of the others. But you're suffering with a rupture. You also have hemorrhoids. That's right. You've come a long ways to get here. You're not even an American. You're a Canadian. You brought with you a son that has mental affliction. That's true. You want me to tell you where you're from? You're from uh, the province of Saskatchewan, Saskatoon, the city. Believe with all your heart and God will send you back home well with your son. You believe it? You believe it? God bless you. You believe? The Lord God still remains God. There's none other but him. How do you do? There's a lady, a stranger to me, perhaps a little older. I've never seen her, but she's she's just a woman standing here. I'm going to have to hurry because it's got seven or eight minutes now. Uh, just look here. Do you believe that these things are true with all your heart? You know it's impossible for me to know what's wrong with you or anything about you. But... It isn't impossible for God to know because He knew even before there was a world. Isn't that right? How many believe that to be true? Sure, He knows every time you'd bat your eye. He's infinite. And just think, by His grace, He's presented with His gospel the same thing He promised to do. Then there's a heaven and we're going to it. And we're in this Ephesus right now. We're in this coming out of one into another. You have so many things wrong with you, complications, so many things wrong. And you're not from here. You're from west of here. You're from California. That's right. You also have a son that's afflicted. That's right. You are... There's something I keep seeing, water, a great big lake. Oh, it's a, you have a, you have someone that's close to you that lives in Chicago that knows me. That's right. That is true. Now, you know, I don't know you, but do you believe God knows who you are? Mrs. McGuire, you've got your request. Go home thanking God. How do you do? Mighty young person. But sickness and disease is no respect to person. How many knows that? We just know that it's no respect to person. If thou canst believe with all thine heart, all thy soul, That asthma would leave you if you'd believe it with all your heart. The chest trouble you believe it would leave you too, sister, and you'd be made well? What did you touch? She's 20 feet from me or more. She touched the master. It's congestion of nerves. You'll be all right. This is a noble thing this young woman stands here for. She straightly is a stranger. I've never seen the woman. But she's been brought here by somebody else. And what brings her here was because she heard a tape that I made. And she's here seeking the baptism of the Holy Ghost. That's exactly what she's here for. That is true, young lady. That's right. Come here. Dear God. 
May this child standing here that's breaking forth from darkness into light, may she receive the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord. Go to her home and her loved ones, showing what great things Jesus has did for her. Amen. God bless you. Go down. Believe me. God can heal all kinds of nervousness. Do you believe that? Asthmatic conditions and make you well. Do you believe that? Then go believe with all your heart. Believe. God bless you, brother. How old are you? You have to come out of that nervousness for too long, don't you? Having all kind of weary spells and everything happening to you. But it's left you now. God heals nervous and stomach trouble too. Do you believe that? Then go eat what you wish to. Jesus Christ. Do you. you believe out there, every one of you? There's a man sitting here with a, a shirt looking to me. Yeah, you look down at his shirt just saying. Yeah. You believe God can heal gland trouble? Can make you well? You was believing then, wasn't you? At the same time, this little boy got cured of that asthmatic condition. Go home, honey. You're going to be well. Believe with all your heart. The little lady said next to your wife there, could you believe your eyes will get well too? You believe that God will heal that eye trouble? Raise up your hand if that's what you're praying. See, what did they touch? Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Do you believe? You believe, young man? God can heal that blood condition, make it right. Do you believe that? Take out diabetes and stuff away, make you well. Do you believe that? Go tell him you believe it and go. Come, sir. Got stomach trouble. You believe God can heal it, make it well? Go believe it. You'll be well. Be made whole. Come, bring this little boy. Look here, son. It's come a long ways. Sometimes changing altitudes, changing climates will do it. A heal asthmatic condition. But there's one sure healing. Jesus Christ, the Son of God. He gave His Son that yours might be healed. Do you believe that? Believe it with all your heart and it'll leave Him. He'll be a normal, well man. God bless you, sister. Amen. You believe? Amen. Is God still performing paradox? Amen. The unexplainable, unreasonable things that people wouldn't understand how it would make, but it's still true, isn't it? Now, how many is sensing and knowing in your spirit that there's got to be something here that's beyond human understanding. Now, I think we called at least 15 people in that line. Every one of them, and there's four, five, six out there in the line, without prayer cards or whatever it was out in the line there, out in the audience there. But we're right now at just one minute of time of closing. Did he do it just exactly the way he said he would do it? Now, how many believe he's the same yesterday, today, and forever? Sensing his presence. Now you've seen his presence. Now your eye has seen. Your ears have understood. And God has confirmed before your eyes his presence. And that what you feel all the time. It condemns you when you're wrong. and tells you not to do that. That same God has become visible to you here this afternoon in his works. How many says amen to that? Sure it is. Now he's here. Is there one here in the midst of us that's never been a Christian Never had any confession. You just never did go to church. Would you stand up and say, I want to stand, not to you, minister, but I want to stand while I'm in the presence of this person, Jesus Christ, who is the Holy Spirit over us now. I want to stand and say, I want you to save me from my sins. That's all I want you to do. Just stand up and that'll witness. That's all we have time to do. Say, I want to be a Christian. Stand to your feet and sit right back down. Is there one in the building? How many is in the building? You ought to say, is there one? Because there might be more than one. How many in the building will stand right now and say, I have been wrong. God, forgive me. I'll raise up to give you testimony that I've been wrong. I'll sit down while I'm here in your presence. I'll sit down and stand up. Is there one? Is there more than one? One hand. God bless you, young man. Is there another? God bless you. Is there another? God bless you. God bless you. God bless you, brother. Is there, God bless you back there. Is there another? I have been wrong. God, forgive me. God bless you, sir. I've been wrong. I I'm sorry, Lord. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Has there been anybody that's been suspicious of this ministry? And you're convinced now that it's true. 
Raise your hand and say, God, forgive me. Just raise your hand and say, I, I was a little suspicious, Brother Bram. It's all gone now. Raise your hand. Not a one. Thank you. How many believe it? It couldn't be me, but it's a Christ, the Son of God. Thank you. And you shall see greater things than this then, as long as you'll believe. Just stay with Christ. I'll do my best to stay right with Him myself. Now, how many here that's sick and needy, raise up your hands. I'm, I'm sick, Brother Brandon. I'm needy. See, just look at the people. Now, will you do this and just believe my word this much? Let's put our hands on one another. I'll just hold my hands out towards you. Let's pray. Dear God, I bring to you this little audience this afternoon where we have heard and read the word of God. We know that it's every bit the truth because it's your word. We have not only now believe it to be true, we know that it's true. We have seen you, Lord, do something that will make people know that there's still, besides a paradox of, of uh, the world in space and the natural laws of God, we can see here where that the law of death working in a human's body, uh, where that science has failed to, to cure by their research. And Lord, we're grateful for those people. We by no means belittle them. We're grateful for them. But Lord, when it comes to a place that they can do no more, now we see your great hand come in, knowing that there's no man could heal them because he'd be a doctor or have to take some remedy. But to see the Son of God come down and that made the promise that we all believe in and every person held their hand uh, up that wasn't saved and, and, and wanted to be saved. God, something warned their heart. Some of them said they'd been wrong, maybe backslidden, and wanted to come back. I pray that you'll take each one back. For they know, Lord, and know, many of them may have known me or of me for these years and know that there's no good thing in a man, and especially me. How could there be any good thing? But yet they see that word that God promised made manifest. They're convinced that it's the truth. They've accepted it. Many here I could not bring to the platform. Father, thou bear me record. Never have I said that it would be something that I could do. No more than yield myself to you and let you take me out of the way and put your spirit in there to work. Now, Father, seeing that one person can do that, other can do it, I pray that each one that has their hands laying on each other, that sick and afflicted, will be healed just at this time. That the great Holy Spirit pass through the building just now and make everyone well. Save everyone, Lord. Give such an experience. Pour out the Holy Ghost, Lord, upon this audience. Oh, we're looking for you to do great things this coming week. Just let it be so, Lord, right now, in the name of Jesus Christ. Now let us all stand to our feet. Do you believe with all your heart? Now, I wonder if our sister at the piano there would give us a, 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 a little card of this. I will praise him. I will praise him. You've heard that? Now, let's sing it together. Now, we hope to meet you tomorrow evening. Now, they'll dismiss officially just in a moment. But I want to sing this song with you. All right? Let's go. I will praise him. Let's raise your hands. I will praise Him. Praise the Lamb for sinner slain. Give Him glory, all ye people, for His blood has washed us. Let us bow our heads now for the dismissing prayer. All right. Brother Jewel Rose is going to dismiss us. God bless you, Brother Rose, while we have her.